Holy Father, your eminences, and the other attendees of the Sexual Abuse Summit in Rome. My name is Chris O'Leary and I'm a survivor. I was sexually exploited, abused, assaulted, raped uh, by Father Leroy Valentine at the Church of the Immaculata in Richmond Heights, Missouri, a suburb of St. Louis. Abuse that, at least to a degree, was witnessed by Timothy Cardinal Dolan back when he was just a diocesan priest, Father Dolan, at Immaculata. My abuse took place in from basically the fall of 1977 until at least December 26, 1980. I know that date because it's written down on a, a photograph. And I have two photographs of me from 1980. The first is a photograph of me and a couple of other altar servers. The second photograph is of me and a couple other guys uh, while we were on a trip to a mud cave with, with Father Valentine, Father Leroy Valentine. My abuse started in the confessional uh, during face-to-face -face confession. When I made my first confession, I did it in a tra traditional dark, scary room confessional. That's what, that's what I used to call it or think of it as. Uh, and then in 19, I think it was in 77, the opportunity for face-to-face face -to -face confession came along. And I immediately seized on that. The way it was set up at Immaculata, and I actually have photographs of the room. Uh, they would take one of the cry rooms. And clear out the chairs and instead just leave two of the chairs in the middle of the room and then there were some sheer curtains that they could draw across the room. So it would end up being you and the priest, in my case, always Father Valentine, I believe, uh, in the confessional or in the, in the cry room, which served as a confessional, just two chairs facing each other. And he immediately started doing things. I don't know how much he started doing during confession, but at the end of confession, he, was all, he would always hug me and those hugs would go on for an uncomfortably long period of time. And I believe he would also touch me on my head, but then also down there as I would make my confession. And then uh, that started when I was in fourth grade. In fifth grade, I became an altar server. Uh, we would have, he had, I remember he had a party for us. I think it was the fall of 1977, October, November. There were hardly any leaves on the trees. I do remember that. Uh, he had four of us over to play Risk at the rectory and to eat pizza. And then we would wrestle and he would, he would teach us how to wrestle and he would show us moves and his hand would slip and he would touch us accidentally on purpose. Uh, and that was how he would gain access to touch us. Uh, I also have a memory, I think it occurred at that, at the risk party where he would kind of one at a time take us out into the TV room. He didn't, I don't recall him playing risk with us uh, it was just the boys who did that, but I know at least with me and I believe with one other guy, he would take us into the TV room, which is kind of a long narrow room with a, a couch and then an old style uh, furniture TV across from it. And I just remember laying down. I don't remember he was laying down. I think he may have been, but then that would be another way that he was touching us. 
And then there was <clears throat> that testing, grooming process would progress uh, where he would take us up to his room in the rectory and we'd sit on his bed. Uh, on the day I came forward, I got a uh, direct message from a guy uh, talking about haircuts. I don't recall exactly what excuse was used to get me up there, uh, but I went out sitting on the bed and he would have one hand playing with my hair, which was long at the time, and he would be saying and whispering things to me and then his other hand would be down there and he'd be touching me. And at least for some period of that time on so in, in both I can attest to this and the, the other person can attest to this, uh, Father Dolan, now Cardinal Dolan, who was living in Immaculate at the same time, they overlapped for two or three years, I believe. Uh, he would be around and would see at least some of what was going on. And I remember one of the reasons why I didn't react more strongly and didn't think of anything of it was because Father Dolan didn't react to it. If, he, if Father Dolan thought it was okay, you know, it, it felt a little bit weird, but you know, I didn't know. But if, if Father Dolan thought it was okay, then obviously it was okay. And then that progressed to what I've referred to as special training, where essentially, you know, normally it would be two or three guys serving a mass. Uh, whenever my parents would go out of town for the 4th of July holiday, Inevitably, Father Valentine would set up special training for me, which meant that I would go up there by myself and serve a mass with, with him. And then afterwards, he would show me around the priest side of the sacristy, which altar boys didn't normally go into. Uh, and he would, I, the, the memory that I have is of him teaching me how to refill the host. There was a cabinet off to the left side that would have these long uh, cylinders of hosts, kind of transparent crinkly cylinders filled with hosts and we would refill the uh, the containers, uh, the bowls that we would use during the mass, we would refill those and while that was going on he would do the same kind of thing where he would have one hand in my head playing with my hair and talking to me and then the other hand would be touching me. And I don't know if it happened on the same day or on a different day, but that ultimately progressed to sexually assault and in rape and and I actually I've actually always remembered what that looked like. I just didn't know what it meant. So in 2002, I was shocked when it was revealed in the New York Times that Father Valentine had been uh, accused of abusing 
a number of guys. Uh, and then they put out a call, the Archdiocese and the Circuit Attorney's Office put out a call for people to come forward. I called the Circuit Attorney's Office, Jennifer Joyce, uh, they never called me back. I always assumed because of a problem with the statute of limitations. And I also called the Archdiocese and lo and behold, by that point, Bishop Dolan, Bishop Timothy Dolan, called me back. Hey Chris, it's Tim Dolan, Bishop Dolan, how you doing? Been a long time. <clears throat> so, so I told him what memories that I had, none of which were really terrible. There was one memory of me coming back from uh, the Mud Cave trip. I was sitting in the passenger seat. Father Valentine was driving. It was like a, it was a station wagon, dark interior, white station wagon, I believe. Uh, two other guys and one of the dads was in the back seat. And I remember waking up from a nap aroused uh, and Father Valentine wasn't touching me then, but I believe he had been touching me previously. Now I've remembered more about this, but I told, I, I told Bishop Dolan, now Cardinal Dolan, then what I have told you, uh, and immediately without any investigation, Bishop Dolan told me, now it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, Father, he told me Father Valentine couldn't have done anything to me. And he told me verbatim, and it's burned in my brain, you know, I've known Father Valentine forever. We were at the seminary together. We lived and worked together at Immaculata. I know that Leroy Valentine would never do anything to hurt a child. I know that he never did anything that he's accused of. And that was a very definitive statement and, and really, really almost good enough for me because like I said, I didn't have any memories that screamed abuse. I had a I had really what one memory that I would consider to be questionable. Everything else was stuff that I really actually cherished because I felt special and singled out. But in retrospect, putting a parent's hat on, it was questionable. But Cardinal Dolan, or Bishop Dolan at the time, did say, it, it, but if you want to talk to someone, I can set that up. Uh, so I ended up talking to a woman that he sold as an independent psychologist, but who I believe was Nancy Brown, the assistance coordinator for the Archdiocese of St. Louis. She again told me, you know, nothing happened. My memories didn't mean anything. She said, of the stuff that bothered me, I was just misinterpreting his actions or his intentions. But it's, it's since struck me uh, as being odd that the Archdiocese of St. Louis would allow Bishop Dolan to investigate claims involving a parish that he was at when the abuse was going on. That seems improper. Uh, yeah, and it, it explains some of, in my opinion, it explains some of his behavior. He was basically allowed, in my opinion, to cover up his own misdeeds. And I say that, and I use a strong word like misdeeds because that's, because that's what comes next in the story. So I called into the Archdiocese of St. Louis early in March 2002, March 2nd, March 3rd. There was another guy who called in then. And then at the end of, the, of March 2002, a third guy called in, a guy who I know, I was talking to him last night on the phone. Uh, and with that third call, that's when the Archdiocese of St. Louis and Cardinal Dolan basically asked slash forced Father Valentine to resign. What really kills me, and I didn't learn this until relatively, you know, quite recently in the past few months, was that Father Valentine resigned in late March 2002 and I was never notified. Nobody circled, <laughs> nobody circled back to me to say, hey, Chris, you know how we said that stuff doesn't mean anything? Well, Father Valentine just resigned, so maybe it does mean something. And maybe we could help you and maybe we could talk about this stuff. That never happened. They just ignored me. N near as I can tell, th that information was never released in St. Louis, which is one reason why 
I didn't, I didn't know about it. It was only discussed in the New York Times, which I didn't read habitually. Uh, and it was also discussed, and I think in the Southeastern Missourian, which is a paper in Southern Missouri. But I don't believe it was published in the, or discussed in the St. Louis papers. So I didn't know about it. I had a newborn at the time, uh, February 24th. So, you know, I was exhausted. Uh, at, at most I was, you know, four week, I had a four week old by the end of March, 2002. Uh, so I just went on most of my life. But then over time, I started having problems that I didn't attribute to Father Valentine because Cardinal Dolan had told me nothing happened. Uh, I started having panic attacks when I took my older son and, my, and then my older daughter to, to confession. And I, I ended up, they went into this, the dark, scary room side, and I went into the face-to-face -face side, and I just melted down. And I, then I went on axe retreats and had more panic attacks and flashbacks and feelbacks during confession and it became obvious to me that I had a problem and then I started getting sick, psychological problems, uh, I had a lot of misdiagnoses, uh, ADHD, Asperger's syndrome, really what I was dealing with was depression and an anxiety and then ultimately was diagnosed with PTSD and complex PTSD. So in May 2000, 11, May 9th, 2011, I went back to the Archdiocese of St. Louis and, and basically asked them, okay, d d Bishop Dolan told me this doesn't mean anything and a psychologist told me it doesn't mean anything, but are you sure this isn't a thing? Because by 2011, I would have been divorced and bankrupt and isolated and estranged from my family and I was, I was sick. I was dealing with some serious mental illness. In retrospect, it was PTSD and complex PTSD. Uh, and they, that, that review team that I ended up meeting with, first of all, it had two lawyers in it and there weren't supposed to be any lawyers involved in the process. That was a violation of the Archdiocese policy and I think the USCCB policy. And then speaking of the USCCB, US Council of Catholic Bishops, they talk about the, you know, assistance coordinators being provided to survivors. At no point, either in 2002 or in 2011, was I ever told of, called by, put in contact with, told to contact an assistance coordinator. It was all, it was just a, it, you know, it's a, it's a phony promise. Uh, and that's, that's where we get into what the, what the real problem is. By and large, kids are safer. Protecting, they, they call it protecting God's children in St. Louis. By and large, that's working. There's still people who push back on it and those people are a problem. Some of those people are priests and they need to be counseled or counseled out. But by and large, kids are safer. Protecting God's children is working. If the summit is about making sure that protecting God's children is implemented throughout the world, then that's a good thing. If Father Zollner needs help making sure that bishops implement protecting God's children, that the Catholic Church formalizes basically the Dallas Charter, the child protection aspects of the Dallas Charter, it's a good thing, needs to be done. But to a large degree, at least in the United States, that work has been done. Kids are safer in the US and people are taking it seriously. The problem is the hierarchy. The problem is the abuse of the abused. What happens to survivors when they come forward and try to get help? As I said, the big promise of the USCCB is assistance coordinators for survivors. I was never offered an assistance coordinator, never told of one. And for a while I thought that's because they didn't have one, but it, it actually wasn't the case. Nancy Brown ended up dying in 2006, but they immediately hired someone else uh, in 2006. So as of 2011, the Archdiocese of St. Louis had an assistance coordinator. They just didn't tell me about her or have her contact me or anything. 
Now, they've told, uh, some people have told me that that was because I had a, a private psychologist who I was working with, which is true. But Deacon Phil Hangen, who was head of the Office of Youth and Child Protection of the Archdiocese of St. Louis in May 2011, he told me that he wanted to talk to my psychologist. And I signed all the papers that I needed to sign. And I remember that because I actually had to do it twice. First time I basically gave my psychologist a blank check and he wanted to tighten things up. So I filled out that paperwork a second time. I remember it because I did it twice. Deacon Hangen never called my psychologist and that damaged the relationship. And I still don't completely know who to trust. My psychologist told me in 20 years of doing this, I've never had someone who wanted to get in touch with me fail to get in touch with me. And that makes sense to me. I don't understand why my psychologist would have an incentive to lie versus Deacon Hangen, who had all the incentive in the world to lie in order to create a problem with the statute of limitations, which sadly was successful. I ended up having to I ended up suing October 2015 and had to settle because of a statute of limitations problem created by, first by Bishop, now Cardinal Dolan, and then by Deacon Phil Hengen and the review team. <sighs> but just to continue the timeline of the story, so from 2011, till 2013, I tried to get help through the Archdiocese of St. Louis, but all I got was the runaround and gaslighting. My nickname for Deacon Phil Hankin was Runaround Phil. And I'm not, the, I'm not the only person who has had that experience and has thought of calling him Runaround Phil. Because that's all he did. He gave us the runaround. He didn't actually help us. On a few occasions, two or three, he asked me for a treatment plan, but he never offered to pay for it. Uh, and at the time, and even today, you know, I'm destitute. I, I have about $30 to my name, in, literally in the whole world. That's all the money, that's my, that's my net worth is about $30. So what's the big deal about sexual abuse? Depression, anxiety, PTSD, divorce, bankruptcy, difficulty working due to the PTSD. So surprise, surprise, when in May 2013, without warning, the Archdiocese of St. Louis permanently removed Father Leroy Valentine. They, uh, he resigned in 2002 and they basically cut him loose to live in a private residence until at least 2005 uh, and possibly even longer than that. And it was actually Cardinal Bergali who cut Father Leroy Valentine loose to live in a private residence, and then Cardinal Burke continued that. And neither Bergali nor Burke made any effort to, once Valentine had resigned, you would think they would make an effort to try to reach out to Valentine's survivors, but they didn't. They never tried to help us. But in May 2013, the Archdiocese of St. Louis permanently removed Father Leroy Valentine. Never notice, notified me, never warned me, never offered me help, of course. Uh, my psychologist had to do that, which obviously was incredibly unpleasant. And it was even worse because, because they said at the time that they in the release announcing the permanent removal of Father Leroy Valentine, they said they were removing him because of someone who had came forward in, 2000, in the summer of 2012. Now remember, I came forward in May 2011. So you're telling me someone else came forward in 2012? <laughs> I'd love to know who it was because I've got a whole list of guys that it, that it could have been. And you, you believed him, but you didn't believe me. And you acted on the person who came forward in the summer of 2012, but you just ignored me. The Archdiocese of St. Louis just ignored me. <laughs> which, is the, which is the worst. It just sucks. <sighs> and that, that mess, that just absolutely messed me up. And you, you know, you want to talk about gaslighting and 
creating problems with reality. I always, I already have problems with dissociation from the abuse, but that just made it worse. It made me wonder whether I really existed. Because how could the Archdiocese of St. Louis so blatantly ignore me? And if you don't believe me, I've got a picture that I'll put up at the end of this that, that demonstrates how the Archdiocese of St. Louis ignores people. But so, I tried to get help from Hagen through 2013. Ended up going to Monsignor Richard Haneke. I was trying to go over, Fang, Ill, over Deacon Phil Hagen's head. Ended up at Monsignor Richard Haneke, who turned out to be his boss. Uh, tried to explain to Haneke that Hagen wasn't doing anything. And while he was initially sympathetic, Haneke ended up just referring me back to Hagen. Or to Hengen, which told me that what I was experiencing wasn't a bureaucratic screw-up, it was a strategy, a strategy designed to make me just go away, run around, delay, delay, hope he'll just go away. Psychological torture. Things got even worse, and I had an even bigger problem with reality when, in January 2014, the Archdiocese of St. Louis, under court order, released the Matrix. A list of allegations was received during a certain time frame, a time frame that included when I came forward. And my allegation wasn't in the matrix. Uh, <laughs> and that was actually the second time that that happened, that the archdiocese was like, who, you know, who are you, you know, who are you? We don't have a record of you. In the May 2011 meeting that I mentioned, they told me they had no record of my conversations with Cardinal Dolan or Nancy Brown from 2002. I took that as lying or gaslighting. It could be that Cardinal Dolan hid my existence from the Archdiocese of St. Louis. But the Archdiocese knew by May 2011, so by January 2014, they should have known and been able to put my allegation in the matrix. And they didn't. I don't know why I think they did it to protect Cardinal Dolan. Uh, so that people couldn't make the connection between Father Valentine and Cardinal Dolan and abuse. And his, how Cardinal Dolan, then Father Dolan, turned a blind eye to abuse. And then in 2002, gaslighted me and lied to me uh, and, failed, and just failed to help me. Uh, and, and as, as proof of the, the misdeeds of the Archdiocese of St. Louis, uh, when I came forward in April 2018, went public in 2018, the Archdiocese, uh, in a statement in, the, in the, the article in which I came forward and went public, uh, they told the people of St. Louis that, that I was lying that my story changed. But here's the question. How can you say or even know that my story changed if as they told me in 2011, they had no record of my 2002 conversations with Cardinal Dolan and Nancy Brown. In order to tell whether something has changed, you have to have two points of data. In, in May 2011, they told me that was the first they'd heard of me. Uh, so either they were lying about that or Cardinal Dolan purged my name from the record. But all of this reflects a pattern that I call the abuse of the abused. And this, this isn't all of it. I'm just, my ears are ringing and I can't, I can't, I'm having trouble thinking. When I talk about the abuse of the abused, this is what I'm talking about. The runaround, the lying, the gaslighting. I went to the Archdiocese of St. Louis multiple times to get help in good faith. Cardinal Dolan just, you know, covered it up, 
covered it up and blew me off and then hid me from the archdiocese, I guess, or the archdiocese lied about it. Uh, they never notified me when Father Valentine resigned. They never notified me when they permanently removed Father Valentine. They, they said they believe in... They believed someone else who came forward in the summer of 2012, but they didn't believe me when they removed, when they permanently removed Father Valentine. I hear all this talk about how, you know, abusing someone in a confessional is one of the worst things you could do. As far as I know, Father Valentine is still a priest. He hasn't been defrocked or laicized or anything. He's been permanently removed. That just means he's not going to be placed in a parish. He's still a priest as far as I know. Uh, so, as you attend the summit, the Sex Abuse Summit in Rome, I hope you will keep this story and this problem in mind. Yes, it's important that kids are taken care of, but I think that problem has mostly been solved. The problem that hasn't been solved and that isn't even being talked about is the abuse of the abused. What is done to survivors who try to get help, who in good faith come forward to get help, who try to do the right thing to go through the process. Survivors who come forward to try to get help are ignored at best. There's gaslighting and all the other stuff that I've talked about. But, you know, the, the, by and large, we're ignored when they aren't lying about us, when they aren't telling the people of St. Louis that we're lying, causing us to be shunned from everyone, to lose every support system that we have. My family doesn't believe me. All my friends are gone. Because they all think I'm lying, because the Archdiocese of St. Louis told, me, told them I'm lying. But... So the, the picture I want you to, to finish with and I want you to keep in your mind is one that was taken at the Mass of Reparations for Survivors in September 2018. A Mass I was not invited to. I don't believe any survivors were invited to. So I decided to stand out in front of that Mass holding the two pictures I talked about earlier that I showed you earlier. Just standing there silently representing the survivors. And when the priests came out to line up, and they stood there for a good 10 minutes or so to line up, to process in, and then Archbishop Carlson came out, got everyone organized, that whole group of 30 or 40 priests and Archbishop Carlson just completely ignored me. Nobody would even look at me. There were a few guys who looked over my head one guy from Father Aaron from my former parish of Mary Queen of Peace, I, I think he was there, and he looked right, he looked over my head, but nobody would look at me. I assume because they would get in trouble from Archbishop Carlson. That's the problem. You want to understand what the what the real problem is, the problem that isn't being addressed or even acknowledged. It's the abuse of the abused. And it's, and it's encapsulated by the picture that I'm going to show you. And pl but please understand that while I'm sh I think that you're acting in good faith, I hope you're acting in good faith, we've got a saying in Missouri, show me.